Mais. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. G.X. Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything's on the One, the first guide of funk. If you don't have your copy, please go over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be glad you did. Also, appreciate the support. Get some official gear at the FunkinStuff.net store. There's Truth and Rhythm gear, there's Funkin' Stuff gear, lots of cool stuff, and it helps show support for the show. Also, I want to give a shout out to the Funk Exhibition Center and Hall of Fame in Dayton, Ohio, which I'm very proud to be an official Funk ambassador. Go to thefunkcenter.org to learn more and keep the funk alive. This show is going to be an interview with Leo Nocentelli, the incredible guitarist of The Meters, I'm going to get up on the phone here in just a moment. He wasn't able to do video, but he is doing it on the phone, and uh, we're lucky to get him. So I hope you enjoy it. And here we go. I am thrilled to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Command Center a funk guitar giant who is one of the founders of the Monumental Meters out of New Orleans. It's a legendary Leo Docentelli. Leo, thank you so much for joining me. Good to be here. And you're coming from, I'm assuming, the Big Easy today? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm in New Orleans. I moved back here about three and a half years ago out of Los Angeles. I was in Los Angeles for about 35 years, so um, I wanted to come home. I miss it, and I'm having a great time since I've been, here, been back here. They could keep you away, I don't think, right? I guess not, man. You know, once once a New Orleanian, man, once, you know, once you always, you know, that never could never gets out of your system. And uh, it's such a unique place that um, it just, it's, it's, it's embodied in your whole body, every fabric of your body, man. It's not like going, you know, it's, it's, New Orleans just have that, that indelible uh, uh, feeling, man. And you, you never lose it. You, know, you just never lose a special place, very special place here. Yeah, I mean, it certainly creates amazing musicians. I think, you know, it's a city and an, an area that almost anyone, it seems like, you know, playing on the street to playing in the clubs is at an, an advanced level and really has the feel, the funk, the jazz. It's just ingrained, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's never, it's never ending, man. Once, once the once a person find out that they, you know, they want to play music, and once they find out that they could, in a city like this, it just, it just influx you, man. It just overwhelms you in terms of uh, wanting to do it. You know, I don't know what it is. You know, some people say it's in the air, it's in the water, but I just think it's the culture that uh, that that you know that every musician feels when they're starting out. And you know, and, and while they were in their that they were in their prime, you know, it's just it's the culture of the city. And uh, being a musician is a very, very special honor to uh, to have, you know, uh, to be able to, and then especially to be recognized at a very high level, like I am, you know, in New Orleans. It's a very special feeling, man. Yeah, well, you're certainly among royalty, a lot of royalty in my mind, you know, from that area. Uh, God bless it, because so much great music has come out of there for all of us to enjoy over so many decades. Um, you know, your style, Leo, is, first of all, I think you're one of the finest guitar players that's ever, you know, played in the funk genre. Um, and there's only probably 
a handful that would go in that in that group. You know, um, how did yeah, you? Thank you. You're welcome. How, how did you develop that style where you're so good at the rhythm parts, uh, but also especially on stage, you you just tear it up. Well, you know, it, it, it comes from, it, like I said, it, it comes from, it's come from growing, you know, and, and, and really, really not forgetting the culture here and, and what, what you're made of. Uh, in terms of me personally, um, and I think it reflects in my playing. I started out playing uh, a lot, a lot of jazz. And then I, th I think, with, I think the whole secret to a musician, especially when it comes to at my level, when I was coming up, I like I had to play in order to survive. I had to play like three or four gigs a day. Uh, you know, I'd go from one one, I'd go from Dixieland gig to a to a, back then an R and B gig, and then I would go play an, even a jazz gig. With, with so you know, my chops had to be versatile to to to, to do that. You know. To, to, and it kind of, I think it comes from the survival standpoint, you know, trying to survive as a musician here. Um, it's not, it's not that easy, you know. I was, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to, do, to join, you know, some different bands that was prosperous and and get and, and was was open to the serious part of um, of being a musician in, in the recording industry. Um, and you know, doing a lot of recording. I did a lot of recording from coming up when I was younger, like 14 years old. You know, I met a guy by the name of Alan Tucson that um, you know turned me on. I, I just was talented enough for, for for guys at his level who has been who's been, I mean, recording hits. You know, years years before I even thought about maybe being at that level. I remember the first song I recorded with him with him was a song by a guy by the name of Lee Darcy. Song called Yaya, yeah, yeah. and that was a long time ago, man. And uh, um, you know, I just I just kept my reputation built build up in the city. And the more my reputation built, the more the better I got as a, as a musician. And it just carried on up until this very second. You know. Yeah, and you actually played behind Otis Redding at fourteen. Is that right? No, no, no. I was, I was not, not, not that. I was a little older than that. I maybe, I put it like this: fourteen, fourteen and a half. No, uh, <laughs> I was maybe, I was maybe like, you know, fifteen years old when I was on the road with uh, with guys like Otis. Otis, I remember, I remember we had a we had a station wagon. We used to travel around a station wagon and in cars. And um, I remember Otis had a, a Ford. I don't remember exactly what year it was. Um, we would be on a highway, man, somewhere, and and I'll hear the radio blasting, and his Otis put pulling up on the side of the car, side of us, blasting his song, sticking his head out the window, saying, "Man, listen to that, listen to my song." And the song was called "These Arms of Mine." Which uh, which was a gigantic hit. It was like he was so shocked and so overwhelmed that the radio was playing his song. You know, this is this is in the beginning, man. When we all know what became of Otis Redding, how how big he got from that. So, um, yeah, wow. yeah, I remember, I remember all of that, man. I was a part of that. You know, I tell people, um, I'm like the Forrest Gump of of musicians and music. I happen to be at places, historical places where historical things happen, and I just happen to be there. I don't know why, but you know, I could think of several different things, man, uh, different incidents, and uh, that that I just happen to be. I one of the things I remember is for the oldest thing, but I remember recording a song. We did a studio called Cosmo Studios. Um, and and it was like the pop the most it was only one really studio Ken Cosmo Matata was his name so I did some more recording with with Alan Tucson and we were recording a song called uh, Working in a Coal Mine and um, and after we got through recording it you know I saw I saw some other musicians come in in the studio so I decided to stick around and, and check it out uh, with a musician. Musicians and then a guy by the name of Wardell Kazare, 
who was an arranger and a producer, um, came in, and then I, then the guy, the, the guy that told me was Professor Longhair came in, and a guy by the name of Earl King. I didn't really know these people back then. I got to know them very well and, and performed with them, but they um, they started recording uh, this song, and I just I was more with that. The song was called uh, Big Chief. Yeah. Which is, is a historical, gigantic Mardi Gras and traditional song in, in New Orleans, man. And, and I was there in the studio when they recorded it. And I witnessed it, you know, with, with Professor Longhair and, and, and Earl King and all those giants. And incidents like that, you know, I just happened to be at that place. I was, like I said, I was like Bar and Gump. Wow. <laughs> Did, did anyone kind of take you under their wing at all in terms of, like, showing you stuff on the guitar? Um, not really, man. I kind of, I, I, I kind of, my, my tenacity, I think, is the thing that kept me going, kept me, kept, kept me uh, drilled uh, in, 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 in the guitar. Just, I, I just, I just started playing, man, and, and I just couldn't get away from it, and, it was something, I guess, you know, the only thing I could say I was meant to do it, to do, to do that, you know, to be as prolific as I've become. It has to be in you. And it has, it has to it has to mean that this is what you're supposed to do. And I really honestly believe that I was put on this earth to do whatever I did. And whatever, whatever I become, this is what, this is why I was put here. That makes sense. Uh, did, did you have musical threads in your family at all? My dad, my dad played a little. Um, he kind of influenced me as to the beginning. When when I was eight years old, he, he played he played a little guitar and he brought me uh went bought us bought me a, a store called Woolworth man mm-hmm. and there's a toy guitar it cost two dollars and ninety eight cents mm-hmm. and it had plastic four plastic or ukulele four plastic strings on it and as soon as I picked it up, I started plugging out different melodies, you know. Um, you know, all I can say, man, it was a, a, it was a supreme gift. Um, and, and, and I think it, it came from the creator. It couldn't have come from nobody but the creator, man. And, and I appreciate that. And I've always, you know, I've always had honor for that. And I never lose sight of, of, um, uh, of the creator and all the things that he's done for me or he or she or it. Or whatever, I just called that supreme entity uh, my creator. Whatever that entity is, um, I was blessed. Leo, share, share with us if you would a little bit about how you came together with uh, you know Ziggy and George and and um, Art and. You know, were you guys uh, playing funky stuff from the get-go, or did you start out with something else and migrate toward that? Well, Art, 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 Art Neville, God rest his soul, he was the first one that uh, kind of gave me a shot at uh, at playing on a professional at a professional level. Uh, he had he had a band called the Hawkeyes that had a few records out. Uh, Mardi Gras Mumbo, that stuff like that, that was kind of popular local hits. So I started playing with him and, and uh, we started playing a lot of fraternity houses, a lot of colleges, um, frat houses they called them. And, and, and uh, just, I, I, I was playing with different different people, with it. mainly I think in terms of the meters, where it came, how it all started. We um, Then Art got a, got a, a chance, got a, an opportunity to play at a club in here in, in, in New Orleans called the Nightcap. And uh, we played around for, for a while, played, played at that club for a long time. And it was uh, the first guy with myself, it was Art, myself, a uh, bass player by the name of Richard Amos, and uh, uh, a drummer by the name of Glenn. I, I can't even think of Glenn's last name now. But that was the band. And uh, what happened was, uh, uh, Richard Amos, the, the, the bass player, he got drafted into the army, and um, then we uh, uh, acquired George Porter, 
And then after that, Glenn, the drummer, died. And uh, there was a little guy around town that had a reputation. His name was Zigaboo. So we got Zig. So Zig came into the band. And that was the first formation of, of the meters. Uh, it was called, the band was called Art Neville and the Neville Sound. And uh, it was Art, myself, George, and Zig. Then we went to we went to uh, after that we went to a, a club in the, on the, on, the, on the, that's called the Ivanhoe on um, Bourbon Street and we played there every every night six nights a week man and um, we uh, there was a song that we opened up our sets with a song called Hold It everybody played it. every band in the city played it so I got kind of sick of playing it. And uh, there was a melody that came into my head uh, that I've been touring with for, about, for, for over two, two years, two or three years. So uh, I taught it. I taught the melody to George Orton Zig, and we started opening up our sets with this song, man. And uh, the song wound up being "Sissy Strut," uh, that became a you know, gigantic hit, man, from back then all the way up until now. And it came out and. Uh, a couple of producers came in, Alan, Tucson came in and said, look, man, you guys, I want to, I want to record you guys. And we said, yeah, and we went in and we caught, recorded a couple of makeshift songs earlier. But when Sissy Strut came out, it sold like 250,000 copies within two weeks. And that was the beginning, man. It wasn't art and that was never sound anymore. It became the meters. And we were the co-op back then. And, um, you know, eight albums after that, here I am. <laughs> wow. Um, but, you know, I think I look at that period, our late 60s, and, you know, James Brown and, and Sly Stone, they get, you know, the all the credit for, for funk. But, I mean, the meters were right there, too, weren't they? I mean, don't you think that no doubt. The, the meters are at the foundation yeah. of funk as well? Yeah, I think it's undeniable. You go back and listen to it and look at the, the years that came out, you know. Um, yeah. But were, were you guys uh, influenced at all by music outside of New Orleans at the time? I mean, were you influenced by like a James Brown or, or other people? Well, you know, it's kind of hard not to be uh, influenced by your peers like that. That's not successful. Um, however, uh, I think the uniqueness of these four guys was undeniable. You know, uh, they were just really four unique people. We all come from different backgrounds in terms of musical education, but for some reason or another, when that four, when those four entities came together, it all formed a very powerful and uh, a unique, uh, and a unique sound. And, and I think it's, it was a mad, it was a magical thing with the meters. It was, it was magic. For these four guys to get together like like that, and and, and uh, the, the music just automatically happened. It, you know, it wasn't forced or anything. Uh, um, you know, nobody outside produced the, the, this music. You know, I was I was maybe maybe the eighty five percent of the, the songs I wrote myself, and I, and I just think it was a magical. You know, even though even though it didn't, didn't make no difference who wrote what, I, I'd always say that. The meters couldn't have happened uh, unless it was those four guys. It couldn't have been Leo, Billy, 
Edward, Jonathan, you know, it had to be Leo, George, Art, and Zig. It's the only way that sound could have happened. It couldn't have happened without any, it couldn't have happened with, with other people, with other musicians. And it was just a thing, I think it was spiritually put together, man, musically. And you mentioned uh, Sissy Strutt, and I just want to mention for listeners and viewers that hit number four on the R&B chart, number 23 on the Hot 100. And um, you, you guys put out so many catchy, great tracks at the time and, you know, through the early 70s. But most of them were pretty short in length. Um, did, did you play for a long time on them in the studio and then just cut them down to be short? Well, it was purposely done like that because at that time, back in the game, if anything, if any record, if they even let their 45, um, if it went past two two minutes and 50 seconds, it was too long. You know, so you had to kind of structure the songs within that, that, within that time frame, I mean, from beginning to end. Uh, especially on, on, on albums, I think the reason why uh, it was like that because the recording was kind of like in this inf in inf infancy, infancy in terms of really developing the, uh, the real the developing the, making making records. You know, there's there's a thing on records um, called grooves that's in, that's what is in the record. The needle hits the groove, and um, if it's too many grooves. It takes away the quality of the of the actual acetate and the actual record. So in order to keep the keep the quality together, we have to make the grooves as less as possible within the with the on the record, the actual physical groove. So the songs, you know, you have maybe ten songs on the on a record on the acetate on the record, and uh, most of the songs were like under under three minutes, way under three minutes. And uh, I think that the uniqueness of uh, that we did an album called um, called this is like our fourth album I think, and on that album was called the album called Rejuvenation. There was a song on there called Ain't No Use that was eleven minutes, <laughs> and that was like unheard of. Um, luckily, by the, by that time they have developed the process of recording where it made. Uh, even though it was long, it still had the quality um, that it still had the, the enough quality that it, it made the songs really audible and, and, and it was powerful and people could still still feel it. But I think the, the reason why I thought songs were, 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 were recorded so short, like about two and a half minutes, it was because of that. But I'm guessing that in the studio, you guys were actually just jamming a lot more than what we ended up hearing, right? I mean, and on those, even on your early uh, shows, uh, did you really, you know, play long cuts or? No doubt. I mean, when we played live, it was different. Yeah. Uh, it was a different thing live, you know. There wasn't any physical grooves. A lot of people think I'm, think I'm talking about grooves, like the groove of a song. No, I'm talking about a physical groove that's in the record. When you put a needle, the record, the needle on the record, it's it it sits it sits in the grooves of the record. And uh, that's the thing that that's the thing that if it was too many grooves, it would take less it would lessen the quality of it. A lot of people don't know that. Gotcha. So, how much? impact did your producers have you know you mentioned alan and uh, later on you had david rubinson i think and you know how, how yeah i was gonna say how much of what we heard was you four guys versus the producer that's all it was you know with alan and and uh alan um and i love alan man i did a lot of things he hired me to do a lot we had some problems you know with alan back in the game and, and he had with us so and, and I have to admire him to take the stand that he did. And he saw that these guys really don't need me in there. You know, they, you know, they, they, in order to, to, uh, to, to make it, they produce what, 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 what the meat is, was doing, it, Alan backed out. And I think that was the most intelligent and smart and, 
and and giving is unselfish move that anybody ever done it was Alan Tucson. He said, "Look, I'm gonna back off and let you guys do it." He could have let his ego and say, "Look, no, I'm your producer, and that's what it's gonna be. You're gonna do what I say." But he didn't do that. You know, he just backed off and and let the leaders do do their thing. Well, I guess it helped when you scored some, you know, good chart success early too. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. So, I mean, the proof, the proof was in the pudding, you know. Why, you know, why, why fix something that's not broke, broken? Right. So, where did you tend to get your uh, composing inspiration from? I don't know, man. It just happened. Like I said, I, I always was a writer. Always liked to write. I uh, always liked to hear what I've created coming back to me on over the speakers in the studio. And I got a kick out of that. That's why a lot of the songs I wrote, I shared it with everybody because it, it wasn't about uh, who, like I said, it wasn't about who who, who made most of, the most money or whatever. Like Sissy Strutt, when I wrote that, I shared it with R. George and Zig, simply out of my heart because um, I just didn't care. I just wanted the meters to happen. It didn't make out, you know, I, I just wanted that, that musical group to happen, and and uh, and uh, the, you know that's why I did what I did. I shared so much, um, but like I said before, regardless of who wrote what, those songs could not have happened unless it was those guys playing it. But they all they all interjected their own individual feeling, their own individual souls and talent. Uh, into in every record uh, that that we played or every record that was written, and uh, it couldn't have happened no other way with with those guys. So, in other words, Sissy Strut, even though I wrote it, it wouldn't have happened with Tom, Dick, or Harry. Right. It would have, would have happened with George, Dick, and all. That's it. Yeah, I mean it's it's chemistry and a moment in time. You just cannot replicate that, right? Mm, yep. That's about it, man. And so many great riffs, you know, too, uh, Leo, like Funky Miracle and just on and on. Uh, yeah, you know, um, I was a writing fool, man. I was just, I was insane, you know. And it becomes a time when, you know, you can write that prolific and so long and so many things. You, you actually, or you actually go insane. <laughs> and that's all you think about. You know, more than eating, more than anything. You, you know, you, or you just, I used to wake up, uh, I often wonder, man, I'd wake up like three o'clock in the morning and I'd hear something in my head and I'd go into a little music on my head with a little tape recorder and, um, and, and put it down. I could not sleep unless I did it. And I, I got to thinking, suppose I just didn't do that. You know, suppose I just slept. You know, there wouldn't have been no funky miracles. You know, there wouldn't have been no look of Popeye. There wouldn't have been no sissy struts. You know, there wouldn't have been no sophisticated sissies. Stuff like, you know, so things happen the way they're supposed to happen. And you guys ended up, uh, you know, I want to ask you what your maybe most memorable uh, experience was on the road. Um, but... The Rolling Stones, you guys opened for them. I know that was one probably amazing experience. Um, what do you what do you, no doubt. what do you remember about that? And was there another one maybe that just was very special for you? Well, as as a group with the meters, um, I mean, I've done a lot of special things as an individual, but the meters, I think that stand the Rolling Stones stands out more than anything as, as anybody could well imagine. You know, opening up for. You know, for a group like that, the magnitude of a group like that, man, it's, uh, it was, we did two months over here and we did four months in Europe. And the pressure for opening up a group like that, here it is, you got, you over in Germany and people are sleeping on the sidewalk three blocks long where they can get, it was open seating, so where they can get the first one through the door. So that's why they uh, slept like that right in front of the building on the sidewalk. And so they, then when, once they got in the place, they want they want to see they, what they came to see. They want to see the Rolling Stones. So here it is for the Rolling Stones in a group called the Meters. Even though they didn't know who we were, 
you know, we got bottles thrown at us, cans and and everything else, and cat calling and whatever. But you know, it would have chilled out once they started to play. But the pressure was of opening up for a group like the Rolling Stones was immense. You know, people who wanted to see the Rolling Stones, they, that's all they came to see. They didn't want to see anything else but that. So the experience of going through that, it, it, it helped. It helped. It helped us in terms of having the confidence that you can go in and, and, and perform in front of people, magnitudes of people, and be able to, you know, make them say, hey, listen, this is what I do. Shut up, listen, and, and dig on it. I was going to ask you about how it was received because, um, you know, years later, Prince opened for the Stones. I was at that show, and he got stuff thrown at him and booed off the stage. Oh, yeah. You know? Stevie, Stevie Wonder got his, um, his mouth split. Might have threw a can. It hit him in the mouth. So that, that showed you what kind of pressure that was, you know, opening up for those guys. And uh, But we did like four months, six months all together. And it worked out It worked out great, you know, great, great for us. We got to be really good friends. I know Keith, I talk to Keith all the time, Woody, Mick, and all of them. I mean, we, we're super, super buddies up until this very day. What's another... Uh unforgettable show either with the meters or by yourself Leo that stands out well I, I tutored Robert Palmer we did a uh, an album called Sneak and Silent Through the Alley with Robert and um, he chose me to go out on the road with him to uh, uh, to perform the song with, with him and I did I did like a lot of a lot of touring with him and that was very memorable that kind of sticked out with me sticked out for me and uh, it was a great time um, I, another time was I toured with Jimmy Buffett, you know, for about six months. That was another time. I mean, any, any, anything that I was involved with, music and the tours, you know. Uh, but I, th I think the one that sticks out really is the Rolling Stone. And I would say as a, as a group and myself as an individual with, with, with uh, Robert Palmer. When you've played with so many amazing artists, um, Joe Cocker, Dr. John, um, Albert mm -hmm. King, and... Um, when you play with these different guys, whether it's jazz or funk or rock, or do you really tailor what you do, or is it just this is you know what you do, and it doesn't matter of the genre? It doesn't matter, you know. It doesn't matter, man. Uh, whatever, as an individual, uh, people usually hire me. That's the only thing. That's the one thing about being a unique player, uh, like I am. People hire you for what you do. Um, and so it was kind of easy because all I did was do what I do, and that's the way it, that's the way it was. It was very easy to do. I just had to be Leo. <laughs> wow, um, that makes sense. I mean, because you're definitely uh, have a unique signature. Um, mm. You know, now the course of meters put out I think eight albums uh, in the '70s, and you were there until '77. It so happens, you know, because of my age, really that I discovered the meters through watching Saturday Night Live. And that was near the right. end, that was near the end of that run. So and then I had to go back and hear all the great stuff that came before that. But um what do you remember about the Saturday Night Live experience and why did you end up parting ways with the meters? Well um that was a unique time man we had just did an album called uh, New Directions. And Warner Brothers was really hot. They said, well, we did, this was our fifth album. So they said, we're going to really bust these guys. Why? You know, we're going to make these guys superstars. So, um, um, unfortunately, we had a manager, uh, not on paper. Uh, we had a manager that um, presented us with a contract. And everybody didn't believe in him. Uh, did not believe in him, so uh, Art 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 did, and Art left. Art was upset because we didn't want to get this guy to manage us. And Art left, and that's how the Never Brothers was found. Was founded, you know. Art got his brothers together, and, and it's from the Never Brothers. But that was right at the peak time of the Demeter's career. We had shows, books. You know, if you if you notice on Saturday Night Live, that was another person. There was another guy by the name of David Batiste uh, playing keyboard in the place of art. And it's because it's because art refused to go. 
and do it right at the, right at the peak when Warner Brothers was really ready to break us wide open. And uh, so we saw the victim, victim of that. You know, I don't blame Art because he had his beliefs. Everybody got their own belief, but circumstances trying to dictate what the future would be, whether you want it or not. So um, we did Saturday Night Live. You I remember Broderick Crawford, mm-hmm. ten full, ten full guy. Yeah. Highway Patrol introducing the introducing introduced the leaders. We did that and we tried you know, tried to hold on as much as we could with Warner Brothers and you know, but once once Art left the group, Warner Brothers kind of lost faith in in in, in the leaders and in in, uh, in us three and, and whoever we else we could hire. And they you know, we just kind of faded off into the sunset in terms of recording. Yeah, that was a shame because also, I mean, funk really stayed pretty strong for another few years before it started to uh, uh, wane into the 80s. But, um, um, you know, but you kept really active. What, what, um, you toured with Jimmy Buffett, right? And, um, oh, yeah. Uh, I just, you know, all of us individually had developed a, a high rep- rep- reputation as players. So, uh, you know, once the group, once they found out that, the group was kind of disbanding. We started getting offers. I started getting offers to do individual plumbing, plumbing with different people. So uh, kind of like stood on the road, you know, with, with different people like Robert, um, Jimmy Buffett, uh, to it with, um, with uh, oh, man, uh, I can't even think of all the people that I did, did I toured with, man. But uh, we all did individual things. And we start doing our own thing with our own band, which I do now. And, uh, uh, you know, one thing, one thing led to another, man. We get together, every, we still get together every now and then and play. We just, the latest thing, we just uh, received the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, the Grammy is recipient of that. The media has been nominated four-time Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominee. You know, I'm the most sampled guitarist ever. Um, so it's all all types of accolades. There's over 400 samples of the meters music, and um, there's all all type of accolades that came after the meters disbanded. So it just never stopped, and it's still going on now as we speak. Yeah, well, just well justified, and um, ha- congratulations on the Grammy, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has been a source of frustration to me. I don't know how you feel about it, but I mean, the meter should be in there already, for heaven's sake. And I think there are other black bands that should be in there, too, that have not yet gotten in there. Um, are, are you frustrated well, I'm gonna by that? Something. I'm going to tell you something interesting about that. Um, um, and I, I had a kind of falling out with, it, with, with, the, with that uh, organization. Um, what they do, what's happening is, man, um, there's about 13, well, there's about, there's 13, uh, people that's on what they call a committee, rock and roll committee, 13 individuals, might be a little more, a little less, um, um, so I'm going to tell you this and I'm going to have to catch I'm sorry to say this, people who listen to this, I don't have to catch this call, <laughs> but uh, I, would, I want to tell it to the, to the, to the public here. Um, they have a policy where they would they would nominate um, about, say, 10, 10 artists, 10 to 13 artists to be nominated for, to get inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And that's fine. That's great. And uh, we were nominated like four times. However, um, they leave it up to, they add the John Doe public, Ms. McGillicuddy, Mr. Bartholomew, whoever, that might not know who the meters are, to cast their vote as to who they think should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So, um, consequently, we were nominated three or four times and never got in it. And, uh, and it just struck me funny why that happened. And he said, well, that's only the people, John Doe Public only accounts for maybe 1% of the, 
of the of the votes of the reason. But that one percent could be the can be the could be the thing thing that keeps you out of keeps you out of being it to keep you from being inducted. That one percent, which is which is um, very significant because um, um, you don't you don't have people voting for the NFL Hall of Fame. You don't have people voting for the Baseball Hall of Fame. You don't have John Doe Public voting for the Hockey Hall of Fame. So why does the, the people have to be involved with voting for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when there's a committee? The committee should, should induct whoever they feel is qualified to go into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Don't leave it up to the people. That's, that's just not, it's not done like that in any other um, John, in, in any other sport or in anything, I mean, there's, um, uh, you know, there, there's tennis hall of fame, there's golf hall of fame people, and it's all, it's all people that's been inducted by the committee, not the people, not John Doe public. You know what they but should anyway, do? You know what they should do, Leo? I, I, I really have to stop this. I want to apologize to the public. I have. My wife is trying to reach me. She's at the hospital, and I have to go. Oh, okay. I understand that. Yeah. I did just want to ask, you know, when people can can see you, um, what anything coming up they should be looking out for. Um, I have a, I have a, a oh, I, you know, I mean, I play all over, but I have a recording. It's a project I did with, with, um with different artists, Pete and myself and Pete Duets with Peter Gabriel and myself, uh, myself and George Duke, myself and Stanley Clark, myself and Harry Connick Jr., myself and Kirk Whalum. And I think I'm really proud of that and to let the people be looking out for that. It's okay. Be, where can, be out in a couple, where can they go to find it, Leo? Um, I don't know right now. <laughs> okay. It's not, okay. it's not released. It'll be released maybe in another couple of months. I guess they can find it everywhere. And I saw you have a birthday but, show coming up with Zap in listen, June. I, look, I, I, I swear that my wife is in the hospital. Okay. And I want to apologize to the people. I have to see what she's calling about. I already missed, missed two calls from her. Oh, I'm trying to you know, talk to you guys out there in, in, cyber, in cyber. So I want to apologize. Thank All you right. for listening. Um, my man Scott is a great. A great, you, you did a great job, Scott. I would love to do it again. Call me again. All right, much appreciated, Leo, and I hope that she's Thank you. that she's well. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, bye bye. Hey, back at Truth and Rhythm headquarters. Thank you for joining us on another magical ride with Truth and Rhythm. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, thank you so much for your continued interest and support. Be sure to subscribe. Go to YouTube. Go to the Funk and Stuff channel. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives and breathes and thrives. Also, goodies here like TIR Quick Takes. And if you subscribe, you know what? You get the show before anyone else. It's free. If you love jazz, funk, R&B, soul, you can't miss it. Pass it along. Tell a friend. Tell family. This audience is growing, and it is a beautiful thing. All coming together for the love of this great music. Also, if you can throw us a buck or two, we could use the support financially, keeping the lights on, keeping the servers going, all these expenses. If you can help support the program, whatever you can give, much appreciated. Go to the funkinstuff.net website. And on the right-hand side of every page, you just click and you can donate through PayPal, credit card, whatever. Very easy to do and so much appreciated. And if you do a sizable donation, I will mention you on the program. Also, drop me a line. Email me at scottg at funkinstuff.net. Let me know who else you'd like to see on the show, what you enjoy about the music. Let's just kibitz and uh, talk about stuff, you know, talk music. You'll find that I respond very quickly, and I much enjoy the uh, rapport and the camaraderie and the interaction. Always remember, this is your show, The True Music Lover. So for now, that's all the time we have for this one. It's a wrap. As always, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.